Good evening. Uh, my name is Graham Allison. I'm the director of the Kennedy School's Belfer Center for Science and International Affairs, and it's a great uh, pleasure for me to welcome you to this forum. Tonight we have a great topic, and we're going to discuss whether U.S. policy should change towards Cuba, particularly the 40-year American trade embargo of Cuba. To set the scene, I'm going to say a few comments, then I'm going to introduce our two guests, and then we're going to be open for lively discussion uh, after they've had a chance to make their presentations. As most of you know, the U.S. has implemented embargoes uh, against many countries, uh, most recently Iraq and Yugoslavia in the 1990s, but no embargo has garnered more notoriety and controversy than the Cuban embargo. Its origins date back to the late 1950s when a young Fidel Castro and a group of revolutionaries overthrew the Batista government. Castro later defined his revolution as a socialist revolution in defiance of the U.S. Uh, indeed, Castro actually came here to the Harvard campus in 1960 and was much celebrated. He appeared over at the, uh, at the football stadium because there was no uh, Kennedy School at the time and there was no auditorium uh, to hold him. Uh, but in any case, uh, as the relationship soured, President Kennedy approved what was uh, known as the Bay of Pigs invasion, in which Americans supported uh, uh, 1,200 CAA-trained Cuban exiles who tried to overthrow Castro but were unsuccessful. Following the Bay of Pigs uh, in, in March of 1962, President Kennedy signed the Cuban trade embargo. Legend has it that on the night before President Kennedy signed the embargo into law, he sent Press Secretary Pierre Salinger out to the tobacco stores of, of Washington, uh, where Salinger purchased 1,200 of President Kennedy's favorite Corona cigars for his post-embargo enjoyment. And I see that probably illustrates a lot about this unusual uh, effort. Not long uh, after the embargo, uh, President Kennedy revealed uh, that the Soviet Union was uh, placing nuclear weapons in Cuba uh, and missiles just 90 miles from American shore, shores. There was the 13-day eyeball-to-eyeball encounter, the Cuban Missile Crisis. And thereafter, a relationship uh, between the Soviet Union and Cuba for 30 years. Despite a brief interlude in 1977 where President Carter dropped the travel ban to Cuba and established so-called interest sections in Cuba and the U.S. Cuba and the U.S. have maintained a very uh, difficult relationship over all these years, most of it dealing with immigrants from Cuba. With the end of the Cold War and demise of communism in the former Soviet Union, Cuba's endured continuing economic woes, thanks in substantial part to its loss of what they estimate to be some $4 billion of annual support from creditor and communist companion countries that dropped when the Soviet Union disappeared. Now, with all this in mind, many groups have since called for an end to the Cuban embargo, while others are more strongly supportive of it. And they see it as a means to topple Castro and his last or next to last remaining communist regime. Many people believe that President Clinton planned to normalize relations with Cuba after his re-election in 1996, but that the shooting down of a Cessna airplane killing four Americans in 1996 ended that effort. Lately, the U.S. has shown signs of lessening its impact of the Cuban embargo. In October of 2000, Congress lifting the embargo on food and medicine for Cuba. And for the first time in 40 years, the U.S. government's allowed companies to sell $30 million worth of food and supplies to the people of Cuba in response to Hurricane Michel, which swept the island on November 4th. That being said, the official policy of the U.S. government, according to the State Department, continues to be, and let me quote, the fundamental goal of the United States policy towards Cuba is to promote a peaceful transition to a stable democratic form of government and respect for human rights. The policy has two fundamental components, maintaining pressure on the Cuban government for change through the embargo and the Libertad Act, otherwise known as Helms-Burton, which providing, while providing huma humanitarian assistance to the Cuban people and working to aid the development of civil society in the country, close quote. 
Many people believe the future of Cuba and its residents are now coming to a critical crossroads, uh, particularly as Fidel Castro is reported to be in declining health. For a country of 11 million, about as big as Pennsylvania, every facet of life is dictated by the leader, Fidel Castro. Many people wonder whether communist Cuba will crumble when Castro dies. Tonight, we have an opportunity to discuss this whole array of issues, and we'll look not only at the long history of the embargo and its effectiveness over the past 40 years, but also how the events of September 11 and the increased cooperation among all nations in the crackdown on terrorism are likely to affect the future relationship between the U.S. and Cuba and the embargo itself. We're very fortunate to have two of the best representatives conceivable for representing two alternative points of view on this topic here tonight, two of the representatives from two of the nation's largest and most prominent Cuban-American organizations. On my left is Ambassador Sally Grooms Cowell. She is the president of the Cuba Policy Foundation, a nonpartisan organization that supports democratic reform in Cuba by lifting the embargo against Cuba. Ambassador Grooms Cowell has a distinguished record as a Foreign Service Officer for the United States, holding a number of positions, including Ambassador to Trinidad and Tobago for President Bush and Clinton, Deputy Assistant Secretary of State for Inter American Affairs, Director of External Relations for the UN Program on HIV AIDS, and a distinguished career as a Foreign Service Officer, the kind of example of what we hope many people at the Kennedy School will grow up to be and do. Perhaps she's best known for her role in housing Elian Gonzalez uh, and his father, Jean Miguel, in her suburban DC home. On my right is another Foreign Service veteran. So this is a great night for the State Department with an illustrious record, Ambassador Dennis K. Hayes. Ambassador Hayes is the executive vice president of the nation's largest, largest Cuban organization, the Cuban American National Foundation, a nonprofit organization dedicated to advancing freedom and democracy in Cuba. In seeking this end, the Cuban American National Foundation supports the U.S. and its 40-year trade embargo on the Castro-led Cuba. An alumnus of the Kennedy School, Ambassador Hayes has served in a number of positions, including coordinator for Cuban affairs at the State Department, U.S. Ambassador to Suriname in the Clinton administration, and he currently heads the Cuban American National Foundation's D.C. office. So we thank both of them for coming. Before we turn to them, let me say a word about the audience's role tonight, or at least what we hope it will be. Many people here have passionate views on this issue and should. Politics is a lot about passion. Mm -hmm. We encourage people to disagree, but it's not necessary to be rude or disagreeable in order to disagree. So sharp disagreements are to be valued, but giving people who have views contrary to yours the opportunity to express their views is also part of what it is to be civil and to be able to have a serious debate. So I would like to remind everybody that I'm not discouraging you from expressing any opinion, whatever that you feel or hold. Right? Indeed, I would encourage you to say what you think, what you really think, but to be also courteous and respectful of other people's views, to listen. We might even learn something. So a civilized uh, exchange of opinion, but in heated debate, is what this forum is meant to be about. And that's something that we look forward here tonight. Each of the panelists will make an eight-minute opening presentation. I may ask a question or two to start with, but we're going to be open for contrary opinions and questions from the audience. And let me start with uh, Ambassador Cowell. Thank you, Graham. I hope I can call you Graham. Please. Because I feel I know you so well. I have excerpts from Essence of Decision, simply the most brilliant book ever written, <laughs> embroidered on pillows throughout my home. OK, I've, so you get nine minutes, yes. <laughs> I'm not kidding. Look, I've even brought one. So I know you'll give me nine minutes, and you'll go easy uh, on your biggest fan. To everyone who worked so hard to this organize. This wasn't staged. I haven't <laughs> seen this film. 
Tobin worked so hard to organize tonight's debate. Senator Pryor and the Institute of Politics, Bill White in the forum, and the good folks at the David Rockefeller Center for Latin American Studies. Dennis and I express our gratitude. When the two of us agreed to travel the nation to do a series of debates on U.S. policy toward Cuba, Dennis insisted on coming here to the Kennedy School, <laughs> whereas you heard he's an alumnus and joked he wouldn't mind appearing at a place where he had home field advantage. Mm -hmm. So Dennis, here's your home field advantage, just as you wanted it. Welcome back to the Kennedy School, where last year the student government passed a resolution calling for the immediate repeal of the U.S. embargo against Cuba. <laughs> Welcome back to an institution named after the president who instituted the embargo, but whose administration's surviving members today say he never intended for the embargo to last for more than a couple of years. We'll get to that in a moment. And welcome back to a city whose great spiritual leader, His Eminence Bernard Cardinal Law, says of the U.S. embargo against Cuba, and I quote, there is no moral justification for the current embargo. In terms of its effectiveness as an agent of change, it has proven to be a complete failure. So welcome back, Dennis. But make no mistake, those of you unfamiliar with the Cuba Policy Foundation will see a debate tonight different from what you may be expecting. It's because the Cuba Policy Foundation is a very different anti-embargo organization. Earlier this year, a group led by Foreign Service veterans who've worked mostly in Republican administrations like me, decided that we, need a home, we needed a home from which to tell an untold story about U.S. policy toward Cuba. That story, among the majority of Americans who indeed favor a new policy, many of us are about as far from the political left as you can imagine. I, for one, got my start in the Nixon administration and was counselor to U.N. Ambassador Jean Kirkpatrick during the Reagan administration. And I served as Deputy Assistant Secretary of State for the first President Bush, who, as you heard, later appointed me ambassador to Trinidad and Tobago. You get the picture. Che Guevara, I'm not. And the organization my colleagues and I formed early in 2001, the Cuba Policy Foundation, has a take-no-prisoners view of the current Cuban regime. Like Dennis's organization, we denounce the human and civil rights abuses perpetrated by Fidel Castro. And we, too, are committed to hastening democratic reform in Cuba. So what's the difference between our two organizations? We believe there are more effective ways to achieve democratic reform in Cuba than an embargo that has failed to achieve reform for 40 years. Worse yet, the embargo has not only failed the Cuban people, it has failed America's own national interest. Talk about double jeopardy. Not even Alex Trebek can explain that combination. And that leads me to the heart of my opening statement. Tonight, I'd out, like to outline six reasons why the U.S. should change its policy toward Cuba. There are many more reasons, of course, but Graham is limiting our opening remarks. Mine are nine minutes. Reason one, the embargo is hurting the American people. Last year, in a report based on the most conservative assumptions, the International Trade Commission estimated that the embargo is robbing the American economy of up to a billion dollars a year. And the Florida International University said a billion dollars a year could be attributed in losses to the state of Florida alone. And independent analysts in the energy field and in the agriculture field say that the losses in those sectors of the economy are a billion dollars a year, at least. Now, I've heard Dennis say those aren't very big numbers. Dennis, I suggest you go to a struggling farmer in Illinois, as I did earlier this week, a scared energy supplier in Texas a hemorrhaging travel agency in Florida. Look them in the eye, not me, and tell them it's not big money. Reason two, our policy toward Cuba may be the longest, most uncorrected foreign policy failure in American history. Forty years after the U.S. instituted the embargo, even tightening the screws along the way, Fidel Castro still rules Cuba. When I mentioned that at our last debate, Dennis decided to recast history. He said the embargo was never intended to remove Fidel Castro, merely to isolate Cuba. Well, Dennis, you got me. Practically every week, your organization's top allies in the Congress state the opposite. 
that we need to keep the embargo until it succeeds in the objective of toppling Fidel Castro, and that's just how they say it. Yet how much longer do we have to wait? How much more economic pain are we going to inflict on the American people? Is there a company in the United States that would not change its business practice if that practice had been a 40-year failure? At the last debate, Dennis, you even trotted out a 1962 quote from Dean Rusk, President Kennedy's Secretary of State. You tried to spin your way out of the embargo's failure to remove Fidel Castro by stating Rusk had a lot of objectives for the embargo, but not removing Castro. Unfortunately, Dean Rusk isn't alive to tell us what he thinks of the embargo today. But other members of the Kennedy administration are. Ted Sorensen, President Kennedy's counselor, and once an embargo hardliner, says, and I quote, the embargo doesn't serve the objective it once did. The communist system has failed everywhere in the world, and it has failed in Cuba. But the continuation of the embargo has only given Castro the excuse for why communism has failed. And Press Secretary Pierre Salinger said a couple of years ago, and again I quote, Kennedy would have gone crazy with the embargo lasting 35 years if he were alive today. Salinger also says that five days before the president was assassinated, Kennedy saw a French journalist who was going to Cuba, quote, do me a favor, tell Castro we're now in a position to begin normalizing relations. That amazing anecdote is from a 1997 story. But reason three for changing U.S. policy is that engagement will prepare Cuba for democracy after Castro. By establishing better relations with Cuba now, America can guide Cuba toward a steady and permanent landing to democracy. But the longer America waits, the greater the risk that Cuba's post-Castro era will be led by an equally oppressive regime, be it from the far left or the far right. Reason four, American people want a new policy toward Cuba. Every recent poll of Americans, and there are surveys conducted by independent, non-biased pollsters, show a majority of Americans favor lifting the U.S. embargo. The polls have it at roughly 50 to 55 percent for lifting the embargo and only 30 to 35 percent for keeping it. Support for important incremental changes in U.S. policy toward Cuba is even stronger, and the Cuba Policy Foundation supports these changes as well. Over 70 percent of Americans, for instance, want to allow the sale of food and medicine. And by a margin of 67 to 24 percent, Americans want to lift the U.S. travel ban on Cuba. Now, regarding the travel ban, Dennis, you're wanting to continue it makes no sense for an organization that says it's committed to bringing democracy to Cuba. I see it this way. Freedom is contagious, and it's time to let Americans travel to Cuba so the Cubans can catch it. Reason five, we need a new Cuban policy, especially after September 11th. After America's war on terrorism, which we at the Cuba Policy Foundation proudly support, the drug trade in Afghanistan will no doubt move elsewhere. And as the drug trade moves elsewhere to all parts of the world, but especially to Latin America, it will bring with it terrorism and other drug-related crime. Now more than ever, that's why the United States cannot ignore a country 90 miles from our shores. We have an obligation to work with Cuba, not for Cuba's sake, but for America's sake to prevent new terrorism and drugs from traveling those 90 miles. Because if you do, you know where they'll hit first? The heart of South Florida and the largest Cuban population outside of Cuba. Dennis, we can't let that happen. Reason six is the Cuban Americans in South Florida want a change in U.S. policy. With all due respect, Dennis, your organization has perpetrated a myth. It's the Cuban Americans in South Florida are opposed to any U.S. policy change. But according to all the recent polls, that's just not true. In fact, in a very recent poll, an overwhelming 84 percent of the Cuban Americans in Miami-Dade believe that the U.S. embargo against Cuba has failed. And that is the biggest problem with the Cuban American National Foundation. It no longer reflects the views of the constituency it claims to represent. You used to represent those views, and I freely admit it. Cuban Americans' views were once more hard, were once far more hardline. Finally, Dennis, and to conclude, at our last debate, I asked you two questions. The first question was, after your organization rebuffed several of my requests for us to debate in Miami, where this issue is of special importance, I asked you, would you now debate me in Miami after all? And I'd like to tell everyone here tonight that Dennis did change his mind. At our last debate, Dennis said he'd debate me in Miami so long as 
the Q we at the Cuba Policy Foundation paid for his expenses, just as we've done here tonight. Thank you. Dennis, this is just a friendly reminder. You got a deal, and it's on take. Why not make Miami our next debate? The second question you ignored completely, and the moderator in the audience let you. But I'm hoping Graham and this audience won't let you tonight. My question was about an advertisement that the Cuban American National Foundation took out in El Nuevo Herald, the Spanish language edition of the Miami Herald in 1997. In your organization's ad, the president, still president of the Cuban American National Foundation, Francisco Hernandez stated, and I quote, we don't consider violent actions to be terrorism because people fighting for liberty cannot be limited by a system that is itself terrorist. Dennis, I asked you at our last debate, and I will ask you again, in the spirit of our government's just and wise policy that terrorism is terrorism, whatever the cause, and that those who harbor terrorists are no more virtuous than the terrorists themselves, will you now repudiate Mr. Hernandez's statement Will you stand with President Bush instead of with the president of your organization? Dennis, I'm eager to hear your opening statement now. But first, let me give you and Graham a copy of Mr. Hernandez's statement. Again, I'm counting on all of you and on Graham to press you for an answer. Will you, tonight, repudiate the statement of the president of your organization? Good. Thank We've you. Got the question. And I look forward to a great evening. Thank you for an opening statement. Thank you. Well, under under the rules of equal time, you get nine and a half minutes as thank well. You. But uh, uh, thank you, Dennis, and proceed. Thank you very much. Uh, it is great to be back here. It's the first time in 20 years I've been back, and, and evidently I need to get back more often to prevent things like that, whatever <laughs> vote that took place uh, last year. Uh, I have to admit I'm a little bit distressed to find that the Boathouse Bar is, is no longer uh, a fixture on what used to be Brattle Street here, I don't know, but I'm hoping other things have stayed the same, and I'm looking forward to the discussion we're going to have this evening. On the other side of the street, there's still a pretty good bar. Oh, good. All right. <laughs> The, uh, the question uh, that was posed uh, in putting this together is, should the U.S. change its Cuba policy? Uh, and I want to start out by saying I, I think this is the wrong question. Uh, and the reason that it's worded like that, it flows from confusion over the difference between our policy goals and the steps that we can or should take to achieve them. Our policy, and, and Sally did a, a good job of reading them out, our policy is to promote rapid democratic reform which leads to a free and democratic Cuba that respects the rights and the dignity of its people. That is our policy. And I would hope that there's no one here who would be willing to accept anything less than that as a policy goal that this nation should have in our dealings with any other nation, be it Afghanistan, Burma, or even Cuba. Actually, I think the question at hand, again, is what can we do to best achieve our objective? And here, I'm going to say that no, we are not doing the best we can to achieve this objective. Or rather, we're doing half of what we should be doing. So let me begin with what most people think of when they discuss Cuba and Cuba policy, and that is uh, the embargo. Contrary to what Sally said, uh, the embargo has succeeded quite well in the goals that it was intended to do. And since we, we've done this, as you can tell, a time or two before, and so we, we sort of uh, know each other's punchlines uh, at this point. And she glossed over a few things there. So let me take just a second or two to kind of go in a bit more detail. There were very specific goals for the imposition of the embargo. And, and Sally, I'm still waiting for you to give me a declarative sentence from an executive branch official that says that there are anything, that the purpose of the embargo is to topple Fidel Castro. The purpose of the embargo was to do three things. Deprive Castro of resources that he would use to promote revolution uh, in the region to make it clear that communism as an institution could not survive in this hemisphere, and to drain the old Soviet Union of resources. That's it. And by that, by these standards, I think the embargo has worked pretty well. First, it's no coincidence, Sally, that 10 years ago, the Soviets stopped subsidizing Castro. 10 years ago, Cuba stopped fomenting actively revolution in the region. And 10 years ago, the Western Hemisphere began an unprecedented period of democratic reform. Perhaps a coincidence, perhaps not. 
Second, Cuba's brand of communism has failed. Nobody goes to Havana to study economics. I don't think we need to spend a lot of time on that. And third, and most strikingly, is the effect that subsidizing Cuba had on the fortunes of the Soviet Union. Russia pumped a lot of money into Cuba. At one point, it was up to $6 billion a year. That's $700,000 an hour, 24 hours a day. And what is there to show for it? Basically nothing. Uh, if anybody's looking for a, a master's thesis, I think someone who would look at what the Soviet Union could have done with an extra $100 billion in the late 80s that they, they poured down the drain in Cuba and how that might have affected uh, the Cold War. I think that'd be a good, good program. But I'm going to go a little bit further. And that is, is I'm going to make the contention that the embargo is responsible for the only positive change that has occurred in Cuba over the past four decades. And, and let me start with a fact to underscore that. Castro reforms when he has to, and he represses when he can. With a sharp contradiction in the 90s, following the loss of the Soviet subsidies, Cuba was forced to undertake some forms of, of change. This is when farmers markets came back, self-employment to a certain degree was authorized, and the dollar was legalized. The interesting thing is that these reforms worked and actually pulled Cuba out of the nosedive it had been going into. The next step that everyone thought that was going to take place would have been a legalization of small business on the island. Never happened. Instead, Castro, in fact, cut back on those uh, reforms that I just mentioned. Now, this makes no sense from the perspective of someone interested in the welfare of his people. But from the rational actor model, and you see, Professor, I too read your book uh, along the way. <laughs> I don't have a pillow to show for it, but I did. Uh, the logic is inescapable. Keep in mind what in Castro's objective is. Castro's objective is to maintain power. And he does this by controlling the economic life of every citizen in his country. Which leads me to my central point. Castro and those around him are the problem. And they've made it very clear that they do not wish to be part of the solution. The revolution has long been bankrupt politically, economically, and morally. Every human rights organization agrees. In Cuba, there's no free speech, no free press, no right of association. It's now over 40 years since Castro promised free elections. What's he afraid of? Well, it's pretty simple. He's terrified of his own people being able to express their will. All right, so what's the solution? And let me come to some of the things Sally mentioned. Maintaining strict economic sanctions is part of it. Castro has exhausted the patience of every one of his trading partners up until this point. The French, the Chileans, the South Africans, the Spanish, and delegation after delegation to Havana, hat in hand, begging for some small portion of the money that they are owed. The only untapped patsy left is us, the United States. Castro needs the gullibility and the greed of uh, uninformed uh, business community in order to have his rickety revolution carry on a little bit further. But economic sanctions by themselves are at best half of a policy. It's like having a very good defense, but no offense to put on the field. What's missing is that for decades, for decades is a program to help the Cuban people restore a measure of control over their own lives. For too long, they've been denied their own voice. It's now the 21st century. Why can't Cubans read any book that they want to? Why is there a limit on access to the internet? Why can't you form an independent trade union? Why do you have to pass an ideological purity test in order to be a student and go to college? You know, Sally and I don't disagree on the need for, for basic human rights in Cuba. And, and again, this is something, Sally, you've added to your remarks uh, over this, and I, I'm very pleased to see that. But we differ very strongly on how best to achieve this. I think we both believe in engagement, but we differ on who it is that we need to be reaching out to. She believes that we should be working with officials of the regime. I believe that we should be standing clear, standing with people like Oscar Bisset, Vladimir Roca, and the other political prisoners of conscience who rot as we are here in jails. You know, we don't need military to military confidence building measures. We need to send a strong signal that the military in the wake of Kosovo and Serbia will be held accountable for its treatment of its own people. We should not be working to perpetuate a rotten regime. We should be working to toss it into the dustbin of history. You know, collectively, we actually have a lot of ability to do this under existing law and regulation. People who travel to Cuba have an option. You can either take a box or two of books to an independent library, or you cannot. 
You can either go and meet with dissidents and independent journalists and librarians, or you cannot. You, know, you can make a difference by insisting on a standard of human rights that otherwise will never be achieved. You know, the, the, uh, you mentioned the, the president of this institution is named after. One of the quotes that I came across recently is that President Kennedy said, those who make peaceful revolution impossible make violent revolution inevitable. It should not be the policy of the United States to make the Cuban dictatorship more efficient. It should be, our policy should be to bring freedom and human rights to the Cuban people. Now, I don't know how much time I got left, but one or two things that I do want to talk about 30 here. 30 seconds. 30 seconds, okay. The question of terrorism came up, and, I, and uh, it seems to me I did answer uh, this question the last time. Uh, there is a difference and a distinction when you talk about terrorism, you have to look at where is the terrorism coming from. There's plenty of violence in Cuba. The violence is of a regime which does not respect human rights that perpetuates its will onto the Cuban people. You know, this nation, th this community is founded upon the condition that human beings have the right to oppose slavery and oppression. And so if you're asking me, do I stand with the political prisoners like Vladimir Oroka? Yes, I do stand with them. And I do believe that a people have an opportunity to defend themselves and to protect their rights. And I don't think that's terrorism. I think that's freedom. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think this uh, terrorism issue is an interesting enough uh, difference of view that maybe let's ask uh, both uh, uh, Sally and Dennis to say again what you think your view is and where it disagrees with the alternative view, just to clarify. Um, thanks very much, Graham. And, and before I answer that question, I, uh, since I um, had to speak first and Dennis got to answer some of the things I've said, let me just make one or two very brief remarks. And first of all, um, I'd, I'd like to just say a word that if the best thing you can say about the embargo is that it caused the collapse of the USSR, I think you're on, on pretty uh, weak and untenable ground in, in this, which is an academic uh, institution. <laughs> Secondly, if you think the American business community is, is uh, the patsy on the left that might get trapped by its own economic greed, um, I'd encourage you to talk to the US Chamber of Commerce and to the leaders of many uh, American businesses, I think they're smart enough to know um, where uh, where it is they can go and, and get um, a good return and get paid and, wh and where they can't. Um, if you want to talk about um, terrorism, then uh, we're arguing the wrong question here because Dennis is talking about uh, human rights violations or people who are in, in prison because uh, they have been put into prison because they uh, um, didn't support human rights. You're you're not, you know, you're you're not going to get any argument from me on that. I'm not arguing that there shouldn't be human rights in Cuba. I am saying that uh, a terrorist action is uh, might be constituted as blowing up tourist hotels and killing an Italian tourist who uh, happened to just be collateral damage. And it seems to me that our line on terrorism, particularly since September 11th, has been terrorism is terrorism, whatever the cause. And those who support terrorist actions um, are as guilty as the terrorists themselves. So I would stand by that position that uh, these are not um, freedom fighters. These are terrorists. Out of curiosity, is Nelson Mandela a terrorist? Is Havel a terrorist? Is Sharansky a terrorist? No. No? Okay. And I didn't uh, say Vladimir <laughs> Roca was a terrorist either. Good. I said um, actions organized from outside of Cuba in order to destabilize Cuba or encourage tourists not to go there would constitute terrorist actions in my lexicon. Let me uh, ask uh, one quick question of each of you, uh, just to clarify in terms of the arguments. And if I could start, Sally, they, you, you said that uh, the American people, and including the American Cuban community in Florida, I don't know if that covers other parts as well, by some discernible majority, are in favor of a change in the policy towards something more like what you like. So. If that's right, and given that we live in a democratic political system and that in the last election people were chasing those votes, well, is it that people haven't figured that out? Or 
that there's some other reason why the policy is not changing. Yeah. Um, thanks. Well, it's not a matter of what I like. It's a matter of, about what's in America's best national interest. And what we're espousing is in America's best national and economic interest. And I think the Cuban-American community is increasingly recognizing that. And there is, um, there is a moving Cuban-American community in Miami, and especially outside of Miami, which is not yet a majority in favor of a complete lifting of the embargo, but very distinct majorities in favor of things like ending the travel ban. 53% of the Cubans, um, for instance, Cuban-Americans living in Miami-Dade County are in favor of lifting the travel ban for all Americans, not just for Cuban-Americans. So I say to if you want to please a politically powerful group um, living in South Florida, please away and lift the travel ban. Um, what we are trying to, to do is to show our political leaders um, that this community is composed of a largely silent majority and a, and a very uh, vocal minority. And the airwaves have been dominated by this vocal minority. But we are now working with Cuban-American leaders, some of, here, uh, of whom are here tonight, leaders from all over the country who are very much in favor of engagement with Cuba and indeed engagement th with the regime of Cuba in order to affect uh, the outcome in that country. Uh, yeah, there's, uh, I mean, Sally, as you know, first off, uh, depending upon how the poll was worded, you get much different results. Uh, I think Dennis, you, these are independent see, polls by see, all kinds of different organizations. I thought you sponsored one of them. Well, anyway. The, uh, the, the point is, is we, that, we is, is one that, of them. There is, are is many that you others. have to look at what people want and what people believe in. And what I find, clearly, and I spend a lot of time talking to people, too, uh, is, is that there continues to be a very deep-seated uh, desire for freedom, for democracy, and for human rights in Cuba. Now, again, as I said, I, I don't know that that's in dispute uh, with anybody here. But it is in dispute is how best to achieve that. And when you were to question, do you think that you need to send money to or to visit your, your mother, your grandmother, your, your cousin, or, or whatever, that is not the same as saying, do you think that we should change our policy with respect to trying to foster democratic reform? So, you know, I, I've, I've looked through these also, and, and I come to completely different uh, agreements. And, and one thing you have to recognize is that in some of these polls, uh, there's, you know, Cubans are Hispanic, but not all Hispanics are Cuban. And so oh, you have to look at, at who the question is being asked to along American the way. Uh, the point is, is, is that I believe that all of us have an opportunity and, a, and an obligation to try to help the Cuban people to, to find their own way out of the box that they've been in for 40 years. And it's not that we or anyone is going to dictate them to them how to do this, but I do think that there are basic international standards, such as being able to read a book or to talk to somebody on the phone or to have an internet connection that we can insist take place. You want to tell well, us you want to I'm just simply um, looking at a recent article. This is just the latest poll which has come out, a Miami poll sponsored by very prominent Cuban Americans, many of whom are either uh, members of the Cuban American National Foundation or recently members of the Cuban American National Foundation, which um, are very different than the results he's talking about. Is travel to Cuba an important factor in bringing about change in the island? 53% say yes. Uh, believe that the 40-year-old policy of confrontation between exiles and the Cuban government has been a failure. 55% say it's been a failure. Should the embargo continue? Well, 53% say yes, but that's a moving target. Um, OK. OK. Uh, well, th I think that's a, at least for somebody who's not been uh, involved in this debate, I at least watched the process during the uh, recent election and the recent primaries, in which it seemed to me that both parties, in addition to thinking about what was in the best national interest, were thinking about where were the most votes to be uh, got and where were these populations likely to be voting. And it looked to me like they were nervous in changing the policy with respect to the embargo because of at least what they thought was the views of these populations. Now, maybe that's not right, and maybe the views are changing over time. But uh, l let me not dominate the conversation here. One of the wonderful things about the forum is that we get uh, folks here of all uh, stripes, and uh, we have actually, by uh, good fortune, 
uh, Congressman Bill Delahunt uh, from Quincy, who's just here as a guest uh, tonight. We're very glad you're here. Bill, why don't you ask the first question, and then I'm going to encourage the audience to stand up at the two microphones. They're both just this one here on the floor. If you get in line, introduce yourself. Congressman Delahunt is uh, one of Massachusetts' finest. So we're glad well, to thank you. you very much, Graham, and it's, uh, it's fun to be back here. Uh, about 10 years ago, myself, I, I led a seminar group on criminal justice here at the Institute, and let me say it was a, uh, it was a very fun time. And let me congratulate uh, both presenters this evening. Uh, this is a, a debate uh, that I think we can all learn from. Um, just let me make an observation. Dennis, you spoke uh, about the dissidents. Uh, I have been to Cuba a number of times, and I've spoken to the, to the dissidents. And I think you have to acknowledge, maybe you haven't been there, I don't know, but let me tell you what my experience has been. The dissidents, a substantial majority of the dissidents, take the position that it is time to end the, to end the embargo. It is not working. It is not working. But let me speak, or let me pose an, another question, or a question, rather. I want to talk about American rights, constitutional rights. And a fundamental right is the right to travel. It's encompassed in our First Amendment. Americans should be able to go anywhere in this world to make their own assessment and evaluation of what the reality is. And yet we have a travel ban in Cuba uh, to, to, to travel to Cuba, or to spend money in Cuba, really, if we want to become technical about it. Yes, the Supreme Court has issued decisions saying that when our national security is at risk, uh, that right can be restricted. But our own Department of Defense, our own Department of Defense has indicated that Cuba is no longer a threat to our national security. Now, I represent an area south of Boston, including Cape Cod, Martha's Vineyard, and Nantucket. And if anyone is here from those parts of my district, I want to reassure them, be calm, the Cubans are not going to invade. <laughs> it is simply not going to happen. And Sally, as you said, freedom is contagious. Why continue the travel ban? Thank you very much, Congressman Delahunt. You want to say something about the travel ban component? Yeah. <laughs> Congressman, thank you. That was the softball you promised me, right? Uh, a couple things. You bring up some good issues. Yes, I've been to Cuba several times uh, and met with dissidents. Uh, you will find dissidents that uh, do not, or rather do support the embargo as an expression of the American people's support for the Cuban people. The thing is, they're all in prison. Uh, the dissidents who are not in, in prison, and I don't, I don't, please don't misunderstand me, I do not want to take anything away from them, but one of the factors that determines if you are a dissident and you are in prison or you are not in prison is your public position on the embargo. That's it. So, you know, there's a, sel there's a selected group that's done in there. And there's a lot more that are in prison and don't, don't come out for time periods. The, uh, you mentioned the defense study. Uh, you know, again, this was a DIA, Defense Intelligence Agency study, which was put together under the auspices of Anna Montes, who you may remember was recently arrested for, she is the senior Cuban analyst for the Department of Defense, and she has been a Cuban agent for at least the past seven or eight years and possibly longer. So, you know, I, I don't say necessarily that means you throw out the whole study, but I do think you got to go back and take a close look at what is or isn't in there in the, in the assumptions that we're working for that. Uh, on the question of travel, and this is a very difficult one, uh, and I know a lot of people, I, I'm not going to ask for a show of hands, but I'm sure a lot of people in this audience have been to Cuba in one form uh, or another. And, and again, I, don't, uh, I know that most people go to Cuba, and they do so with good intentions. There are some people that go there because they want to lie on the beach and drink rum. You know, you can do that in other places, but they go there to Cuba. There's others, people who go there because they want to try to help the Cuban people. And what I'm saying is if you do go to Cuba, if you have a legal license to go, 
Go and make a difference and do something. Don't just go and become part of the problem. You know, it's the old thing about your rights uh, to free expression end at the point of my nose. Uh, when you go there and you know that you are going to contribute monetary reserves to a system that in turn takes that money and uses it to repress its own people, then I think you've got to look into your heart and see is that really what you want to do and what you can do. How about 30 well, seconds? Out 30 seconds. Don't remittances from the Cuban-American community also go into the pockets of the regime? How do you? A small portion, yes. A large portion. Who buys in dollar stores? So I mean, All right, but you're uh, confusing again the difference between no, I, I don't. between taking care of your family and opposing. Well, regime. again, and you're you you're both, saying to be the go. judge and jury about what's purposeful <laughs> and what helps the people and what helps I'm, the I'm regime, and I'm saying that I don't think you can be at all that sure. And uh, okay. okay, on that point of agreement, <laughs> I'm going to the lady here on the right. Let me get you to please identify yourself. Any opinion you hold, please express, but uh, briefly as a question. Yep. Hi, good evening. My name is Helena Fernandez, and uh, I'm actually in the marketing world. I'm not politically associated with uh, anybody. I'm an independent voter. Um, but I'm also Cuban-born, and I just want to share a couple of things, because some days I wake up uh, thinking that I'm pro-embargo. Other days I wake up thinking I'm anti-embargo, so I don't know what the right answer is. Two observations um, on things that were mentioned tonight. ROI for the business community. I think you mentioned that the business community was not that naive. And my personal experience after having been in Cuba and done my, my graduate thesis on private investment, an irony, in Cuba, <laughs> is that, yes, uh, the business community is very sophisticated about ROI terms, but you cannot have an ROI model unless you have some stable and consistent rules. The problem is in Cuba is that the rules change all the time, and they change just to support the power of the person who is running the country. That has been my personal experience, and also my research has shown that as well. So that's why just my observation. Um, I think that the business American community is very savvy. I mean, I was trained here, but I think they're very naive about politics in Cuba. Um, that's my personal um, impression. On the uh, travel ban, what I have to say about the travel ban, I, when I was in Cuba four years ago, I was very insulted as a, as a woman because most of the most of the tourists who came there from Latin America were men, and it was very obvious to me that the travel to Cuba and this is from a the people of Cuba perspective. This is not from an American government American perspective of the or the government of uh, or the people of uh, the United States. I would like to uh, be sure or 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 I feel I feel very strongly about the fact that. People who travel to Cuba right now are really, in, in many ways, um, creating what we had pretty much in the 50s back over again. Tremendous amount of prostitution. I was embarrassed to see these poor young women selling themselves for a Diet Coke with Rome, uh, rum for the ability to have access to hotels, which they don't have on a regular basis. It was pretty embarrassing. And I don't know what the right answers are. I just know that as a fellow, uh, that as a Cuban woman, uh, I'd like to see freedom and democracy in Cuba, and I'd like to benefit the people of Cuba, not the government of Cuba. Good. Thank you. A very good comment. Yeah. Uh, let me try very short answers because we have lots of questions. If you've got a 30-second point, Just, please. Yes. Yeah, I, I, I very much appreciate you know, that personal insight there. And when we change a little bit, just talk about the business community. Uh, you know, Sally said the business community is against sanctions. That's not correct. The business community loves sanctions. They love sanctions for economic reasons. You know, if you're dumping steel in the United States uh, or alleged to dump steel in the United States, if you're producing pirate CDs, if you're doing whatever, believe me, the business community wants to have sanctions placed on your nation. The business community doesn't like sanctions for political reasons. So what it boils down to is if you're burning dissidents in the town square, well, that's too bad, but we can work with that. But if you're pirating CDs, Lord help you. You want 30 seconds yeah, of that? Yeah, well, I would just say in response to your very thoughtful question that, you know, I've been in a lot in America, Latin America and in many other developing countries and so have a lot of other people in this room and we've all watched American industry try to engage and sometimes I had a lot to do with NAFTA and sometimes engage with very shifting sands. But I think we discover that generally speaking American business is pretty savvy and it won't go where it doesn't think that um, the rules are sufficient to permit it to make a profit. And that that involvement of American business also strengthens the hands of reformers in those countries. And, and I think the same thing would happen in Cuba. I look at it and I say, if Mexico, why not Cuba? 
This gentleman on the left, please. Thank you, Mr. Allison. Uh, Ms. Gull, uh, Mr. Hayes, welcome. My name is Jarrett Barrios. I'm the state representative uh, from this uh, community of Cambridge. I'm also uh, Cuban-American. Uh, I have family in Bejucal, uh, which is a town just outside of Havana, and also in the neighborhood of San Miguel de Padron, which is uh, in the city of Havana. Uh, and I guess it's in, in sort of the spirit of that that I, I came here today, and Mr. Hayes, I take very seriously uh, your concerns uh, that you've expressed at many levels about the lack of certain freedoms. Uh, in Cuba, be they freedoms of association, First Amendment freedoms that we might take for granted here, as well as certain economic freedoms, having had family members who tried to set up uh, their own little pizzeria uh, in San Miguel de Padron, uh, which because of the changing rules, uh, they weren't ultimately successful with. So taking very seriously your argument, uh, your sort of uh, problematization, your sort of argument that we've, we've got a problem here, uh, I guess I'm really, really puzzled why uh, you would argue that the answer is the same thing we've been doing for 40 years. I mean, at some point, you got to just say that dog doesn't hunt anymore. You can't keep saying the same thing. If you've argued, as you effectively did, that there's problems there, you argued that there's no freedom of association, you argued that there's no First Amendment, you argued that there's no economic freedoms, and yet you expect us to accept as policy to cure that, mm -hmm. the thing which hasn't cured it in 40 years. Mm -hmm. How can we not look to Ms. Cole or others who might propose alternatives which have worked in other countries, alternatives which the Cubans, at least my Cuban family, who have suffered under Castro, certainly would embrace, and all of their family all of their neighbors. I have not met a single person in my five visits to Cuba to visit family members, the hundreds of people I've spoken with who've supported our efforts there. Now, you may be talking to different Cubans, and maybe you speak Spanish with a better accent than I do. I don't know. Cuban Spanish with a better accent than I do. But my question to you is, given that we haven't had anything in 40 years, how can I take you, how can this audience take you seriously when you tell us that you want to see you want us to avoid violent change, and that is why we need to have a peaceful remedy now. When your policy does nothing but promote long-term frustration among Cuban Americans, Cubans, people in Cuba, that will ultimately destabilize that country because we don't have the very links that Ms. Cole is talking about. That's my question. Okay, good. All right. The good question one. is clear. <laughs> yes. Uh, how about well, the answer? Well, uh, what I, I'm trying to convey is, is that, again, that for a very long time, we really have not had a policy that was to promote change in Cuba. We had a policy that we could say to the Miami political community, here we're being tough on Castro, uh, but there was no cost to really anyone in the United States, the American business community or anyone. And it was not a serious effort like we had in Eastern Europe, like we did in the Czech Republic and Poland and South Africa and lots of other places, to go in and create a democratic opposition over the objections of the regime. So that is what's missing. I don't think we've done that. And, and I think you have to have the two pieces together to, to work. Now, uh, on the idea of working, I mean, what, I understand uh, what you're saying, and I think what Sally was saying is, you know, tourism, trade, investment can lead to democratic reform. Uh, a couple things. The Canadians tried this. In the early 90s, they went in. They were going to show us how to do things. Uh, they, they sent in hundreds of thousands of tourists. They sent in lots of money. Uh, they have investment and everything, and if you ask the Canadian government what they have to show for it, they will tell you nothing. There has been no political movement on the part of the Castro regime, despite all of the trade and the investment from Italy, from France, from Spain, from Mexico, from everywhere in the world but the United States. Everywhere in the world, Canon does trade with Cuba. They don't get paid, but they can trade with them. Now, if none of that has produced any reform, what is the guarantee or, or what is the hope that our added to that is going to be enough so that all of a sudden Castro will say, oh, I was wrong and I, I'm going to move in this direction? This is a key, key question. And again, Sally, one of the things that we argue about in debate is, is, is that, you know, of course, exchanging ideas and talking to people is a good thing in and of itself. But it's not enough to change the character of a repressive regime. It's not going to change as Saddam Hussein. It doesn't change the Chinese leadership. And it certainly isn't going to change Fidel Castro. Sally, do you want just 30 seconds? Or mm, your, I think we should go on Great. to another question. Great. Thank you. Hi, my name is Luli Duke. I'm a Cuban-American. And yes, I'm from the Duke of uh, the Harbor of the South. Uh, I'm uh, president of Fundación Amistad. And my question to you, Ambassador Hayes, is will you or will you not deny the statement on terrorism made by your president? Of your association? The, the statement that, that Sally read uh, to me 
uh, needs no reason to be denied. I mean, I, let me ask you, do people have a right to freedom? If you are enslaved, do you have a right do to fight have a right for your to freedom? Survive? I understand, yes but no. my you know, question this is, is This is what you. this nation, our nation, is founded on. It's what we actively promote in South Africa, in Eastern Europe, uh, throughout the entire world. Why is Cuba different? Why is it the Cubans aren't entitled to the same rights and consideration? But you're not answering my are? question, sir. So I just no. I, I stand. Yes I no. believe. I'm a, listen. I believe in in a nonviolent transition for among other reasons because it's the regime that has a monopoly on violence, and so it just doesn't work. I, I don't. I wouldn't recommend it, even if morally I, I felt it was the right thing to do. But I believe that you have to create. A, a nonviolent democratic opposition inside Cuba. And that's what guys like Oscar Bisset and Marta Beatriz and other people are doing. And we have to help them because I, it's them against Castro and all of his regime. I understand, but you didn't answer my question. Well, I did. I don't, I see nothing in there that, that I would or could repudiate. It's what, what I believe people have a right to freedom. I, I Nelly, would you agree uh, well, or disagree. Yes, I uh, I would agree um, with Mrs. Duke that you didn't answer her question. But I would yeah. also say Can that I answer the question. Um, yes, you know, no. the shooting shooting down of a of a Cuban uh, airliner no in 19. No one is talking about that. That is terrorism. That is terrorism. That is terrorism. So is that a, a we don't condemn these violent actions no, condemn in in support of free. Civilian aircraft is terrorism. Punto. Fine. Okay. But, Absolutely. You know, the the Thank right you. of a people to be free is not negotiable, and certainly not by people in another country. Okay, I think uh, this is uh, ladies next. Yes, um, just as something quick that just came from what you said, which isn't actually my question. <laughs> I understand that the people who did blow up that civilian aircraft and were for prison in a while, for a while in Venezuela are now living at large in Florida, and everybody knows who they are. But that's just, that just came out of what you said. I actually have a question that I've been wanting to ask you, Mr. Hayes, since 1994. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. <laughs> you were on the Cuba desk at right. the time at the State Department. Please identify right. yourself. My name is Marianne Sara, and I'm not, I'm not Cuban-American, but my daughter is Cuban-American. Mm -hmm. And in 1994, she still had a father and a grandmother and a grandfather and mm -hmm. brothers and sisters and cousins and aunts and uncles and everybody else in Cuba. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, in September 1994, she could no longer go to visit them whenever we could get together the money to go. You know, mm -hmm. at the time we didn't have much money and it was hard to go, but we went as often as we could, sometimes several times a year, mm -hmm. sometimes once every two years. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, in 1994, we couldn't do that anymore. Mm -hmm. And in fact, the travel ban was tightened up for everybody. Mm -hmm. In May of 1999, when you weren't there anymore, but I still would like to, <laughs> to ask you the question, the travel ban was changed, and now any college student mm -hmm. whose institution has a license, anybody who can establish a professional interest in doing research in Cuba, mm -hmm. can go to Cuba, no questions asked, but any Cuban-American can go once every 12 months, unless they petition the Treasury Department for a special license, and you know, sometimes they get two weeks when they want a month, and sometimes you know, they don't get anything. Mm. What's the rationale for that? If, let's see, what did you say? Exchanging ideas and opinions is a good thing. Why is it better for college professors to exchange ideas and people-to-people -people contact with, with uh, Cubans mm. than for their own relatives to exchange ideas and opinions? Mm. How does college, I have nothing against college professors, believe me. Okay, We've got, we got the question. Okay. You got the question. Make, make yeah. sense of 94 and 99. Okay. Yep. Uh, yeah, in 94, you may remember that was the Raptor crisis, and I think that the travel was restricted during that time period because there was a, a migration emergency going on. Uh, I would, you know, personally, we support, I support, what we call purposeful travel, and that is, is travel of people who go and do things. And I have no problem with family members going to visit family members. In fact, I think it's very destabilizing. And I have no problem with university professors who go, except for the ones who are on the, you know, the kumbaya circuit who go down there and don't do anything. You know, if you're going to go, do something and, and help people. 
And, and but for family travel, you know, I, you know, I'm not with the government anymore. Neither is Sally. Sally used to be my boss, by the way, and and uh, tried to straighten me out on more than one occasion. And you can see it didn't work. <clears throat> but you know, the, that I would personally, as long as this, there is travel that is going and is helping to establish family bonds, I'm all in favor of it. But you are. If, if I have it correct, Executive Vice President of the Cuban American National Foundation. Yeah. Does this mean that the Cuban American National Foundation would now support mm. Cuban Americans being allowed to travel to Cuba more than once every 12 months? Uh, would you encourage your you know, organization you know, to take that position? We, we don't have, as an organization, we don't have a formal position on that. And the reason is, is because it's, it's a very personal and, and emotional issue. And there's people who you're fall on all sides. You're not the law. You're talking I can tell about you the law. From, from my position is, is that I advocate purposeful travel from family members, from university professors, from you name it. Will you advocate that in your organization? I, I do. I do. Okay, good. Yeah, that's a good, good card question and a good answer. This lady, please. Hello, my name is Janethea Hoogs. I um, just graduated from the college here. I'm now at the Graduate School of Education. I am half Cuban American, half African American from Miami. And I am a little confused, and so I just wanted to clarify a couple of things. Um, it was stated that we don't have a policy. Well, no, first it was stated. It's a little confusing. Quote, our policy is rapid democratic reform. It was stated that that is our policy. Immediately thereafter, it was stated that that is our policy goal. Then it was stated that our policy goal is not to topple Castro, but to isolate him so that he can't encourage all this revolutionary stuff. Um, and that the revolution, quote, is, has been bankrupt because of our embargo. Um, and that's what's missing is positive effort essentially towards social reform, that the economics are good, but the social half isn't there. And I'm a little unsure of how you consider things like the legalization of the dollar in Cuba as a positive act. And um, if you're looking to isolate Castro and to bankrupt the revolution, how that is actually being accomplished, given that Castro is one of the wealthiest men in the world. Um, and also in terms of trying to encourage democratic reform, given that if you speak to the majority of the dissidents in Cuba, as you mentioned, many of them are in political prison, where my uncle was for over 30 years as well. Um, you'll find that the dissidents may have differing opinions, but the Cubans who con completely encourage and support Castro, they hate the United States. Because of the embargo, because of the imposition of the dollar, because of all these various reasons, they don't like the United States. And so if we want this embargo to bring about some sort of positive influence or democratic ideals, I think that it's not accomplishing that because in fact, they dislike the US more because of it. And so I just wonder what your thoughts are on that. Well, I think the question was, was essentially addressed to you, but I would simply okay. say that I think the, the embargo, um, you know, gives uh, Castro the big ex excuse he has for staying in power and that removing the embargo would lead to very rapid democratic reform in Cuba. And that's why I'd like to see it eliminated as fast as possible. And I hope we'll have the support of our friends in Congress to do exactly that. Uh, let me give you one example uh, on legalization dollars that you mentioned and how that's different and how it affects the policy and how it affects Miami and, and all of these things go together. Uh, up until the early 90s, it was illegal to have dollars. So if you wanted to help a family member, what you had to do was send money basically to the Cuban government who would take it and an artificial exchange rate give pesos to, to your relative. Mm -hmm. After that, because of the pressure of the embargo, that Castro had to do something to attract more foreign exchange into the country. So he did legalize dollars, which meant you can go down to Western Union and you can send money and you can be very confident that it will actually get into the hands of your family member. Again, it's not that people dislike Castro less, but they, they love their family more. And, and so this is a good thing. And, and yes, some of it gets to the regime, but it's a trade-off. And, and I think in Cuba, it's always a mistake to, to think that everything has to be 100% or 0%. There are gradations and there are trade-offs that are involved uh, in all of this. As to the regime adherence, you know, the, the people who, who, knowing, who have a position of authority and power and choose to help perpetuate a regime that they know violates the rights of their fellow citizens, I don't want them to like us. They're the guys we need to get rid of. And so get them out, and let's go with the other 11 million Cubans. If I could just 
um, to make two comments. Number one, regarding what you just said, brainwashing is something that you should keep in mind. Um, number two, in terms of the legalization of the dollar, um, given that the majority of Cubans are paid in the jobs that they do have in Cuba in pesos, right. but that only the American dollar is really valued, what right. you have is people who work, right. make something that they can't use to buy anything, yeah. and therefore need to get more money from their relatives for, but they see the U.S. as the enemy because mm -hmm. there are restrictions on how they can do that. So yeah. just something to put in your head. Okay, thank you. A complicated issue. We're to this gentleman. Um, good evening. My name is Kevin. Uh, Hi, Carlos. And I'm a junior in the college. Uh, my question is for Ambassador Hayes, um, and it's in response to um, a little trick I think you made in your argument during your opening statement. You said that when the embargo was first initiated, it had three purposes, um, to deprive Castro of the resources to cause mischief, to make a statement against communism, and to weaken the USSR. And uh, you challenged your colleague here to come up with one statement from the Kennedy administration, which they said the objective was to topple Castro. And I think, uh, I presume you made that argument because 40 years later, the regime has not been toppled, and it would seem to be ridiculous to assume that was the goal in the first place. However, somewhere along the line, um, you then all of a sudden began arguing that the goal actually does appear to be dustbin of history with Cuba. Yeah. Um, so I wonder either, A, when the United States, is a, United States objectives changed from the three that you listed and three that appear to have been met to the stance you're advocating for now. Um, in fact, I guess that's my entire question, so thank you. <laughs> okay, well, yeah, this is sort of the moving goalposts uh, argument, is that we ask for one thing and then we change it and ask uh, for another. Uh, and, you know, hey, 40 years is a long time, and, and our objectives and the sorts of things that we, uh, we asked uh, of other countries is different now than it was in 1959. I mean, I have, I, you know, I make no apologies for saying that, that at this point, the embargo, among other things, is a moral statement that we as a nation choose not to do business with a regime that represses its, its citizens. And, you know, and I know we, do, we don't do that in other places. I know that. And I would say look at, at the results of what's happening in those other places where we violate that rule and tell me whether it's worth the price uh, or not. But I assume you don't think we should do business with Cuba because you think um, it will have the effect of destabilizing the regime. Is that correct? Uh, I don't, well, among other reasons you don't do business with Cuba is because they're, they're broke and they have no money and they're counting on the United States Congress uh, to bail out the bankers who would make the loans to the businessmen who would then do business with Cuba. So No it, different from Spain or Canada or any other. Okay, country. well, so it does, it does sound like destabilization, destabilization is in part your goal. And then my question is just yeah. why now um, well, is yeah. it more likely to be effective than it has been for the well, I, I don't years. think that we've been doing it, and I think that's the problem. We've been pretending to have a policy, but we haven't really had one. And now we have an opportunity to put one in place, just in time, I hope. Thank hope you. It's not too late. Okay, let's go to this gentleman. Uh, I, I'm a public policy student here. Um, my question for the panelists is how broadly your principles apply. Uh, I worked in 96 with uh, some Amnesty International groups trying to get sanctions on Myanmar, Burma, and I, I can't imagine a situation like that or in South Africa somebody could argue against sanctions. And so my question is what, as a student of public policy, what indicators do you look for in a situation to tell you whether or not sanctions or embargo are going to be effective in accomplishing the goals which I think most people agree of, human rights and freedom and those things. And, you have, you know, and how do you do that in a, in a setting where in a Congress who lets China into the WTO and, and sort of has these very confusing ethical lines? Well, I'd say, and as a first response to your question, first of all, you need to look at what the rest of the world is doing. We just had a vote in the United Nations a week ago in which 167 nations to three voted against our policy of the embargo against Cuba. Um, the three voting with the United States were the United States and Marshall Islands and Israel. Um, and that's consistent over a number of years. So one of the things that makes sanctions um, more effective is if they're multilateral sanctions, if the whole world agrees with you. These are unilateral sanctions. They're very unlikely to ever be effective. So that's one of the ways I'd start out. Uh, you know, there's somewhere UN votes against Israel and, and lots of other issues, and the fact that we're on the right side, uh, we don't have a lot of people uh, on there with us, I think says more about them than it, than it does about... 167 about to 3. Well, exactly. Yeah, but where's France, else France? Where's Canada? Where's Spain? Where they're, everybody they're else is wrong in the world. In but the Marshall the Islands, their money and back. they're right. Okay, this lady. I think it... Mm -hmm. Oh, I'm sorry. Is this gentleman next? Yes. yes. Please, excuse me. Yeah. 
Ambassador Hayes, my name is Stephen Mindish. Uh, I have been to Cuba. I am married to a Cuban American. And um, I wonder why you believe that it is unreasonable to assume that the best thing for the Cuban people would be to lift the embargo. And if we lifted the embargo, the worst thing of that would be for Castro insofar as it would, in fact, lift the barriers to the very things that you talk about are necessary to create the opportunity for the exchange of ideas, human rights. As I have spoken to the people that I've met in Cuba and I've met uh, people at all levels in, within the society, um, the only people that seem to support uh, the notion that the embargo is a good thing are the people of the government who use it as the excuse for the lack of freedom of speech to the lack of medicine to the lack of food. And it seems to me that Castro is the number one proponent of keeping the embargo in place. Yeah. Well, Castro uh, you know, is a brilliant politician. Uh, and he always is able to turn things Which, to by the end. way, is the whole reason for the uh, legalization of the dollar. It certainly is not a philosophical issue. It's a well, pure it's a way of financing his country when the Soviets left. Right. You know, the, the concern in the debate, as you hear the questions and as we talk about this, uh, it, it all comes back to the embargo. And again, what I try to do is pull it back a little bit. And this is that the goal, let, let's look at the goal and then look at the embargo for what it is, which is a tool. And, and, and my point is, is it's a tool that accomplishes what its limited objectives are, and that what we need are other tools <coughs> to add into that. And, and again, I mean, you know, you travel to Cuba and, and you do the sorts of things that, that I think I'm encouraging people to do. But unfortunately, you're one of very few that do that. And if you look, because we if can't you look, go. If you look at, you no, know, there's, you know, there's 200,000 Americans that You've go. You've got to go through hoops Americans. and loops and yeah. wait, and you can't right. go. Right. Ambassador, you, you know the let truth. Let me ask you, what, what if we lift the embargo, we open up trade, we do all of this, and it turns out you're wrong? Then what? Well, at least we would have tried something well, different no, we than would have tried we've been and doing we would have said, for 40 said, gee, silly years. Gee, that's too bad. And, you know, same thing like, gosh, those Taliban guys are bad. And, gee, Iraq's got a bad government. And, gee, Burma has problems. And we would wash our hands. Well, what if we didn't fight the Taliban? We could have said, oh, gee whiz, we're not going to fight them. Right. I don't understand no, non-action as an action. You right. need to look to promote a standard of of democracy and human rights worldwide, wherever it is, left, right, top, down, doesn't matter. Let's have one standard for everybody across the world. That's all my name. This lady on the right. Yes. Hi, my name is Wendy Maldonado. I'm a master's in public administration alum of this school. Um, my question is for Ambassador Hayes, who seems to be very popular this evening. Um, I'd like to push you more on the issue of freedom of expression, which you kept emphasizing in your opening speech. Yep. And I'd also like to push you on the relevance of the Cuban American National Founda Foundation in this whole debate today. Um, it, from what I've read, there's actually an ideological divide between older and younger Cubans, Cuban Americans in Miami on this issue of whether the embargo is the most effective way to achieve mm -hmm. the end result of, of bringing democracy to Cuba. Mm -hmm. And there seems to be a big issue around freedom of expression, not just in Cuba, but in Miami on these very shores of whether people are afraid to speak out or not against the embargo within their own community because they're, they fear retaliation from members of their own community within Miami. So I'd like you to flesh that out a bit as well because I think that the whole issue of freedom of expression within the Cuban American community is a very real one as well in this debate. And secondly, it seems to me, I'm not Cuban American, but it, I don't understand the relevance of the Cuban American National Foundation, which to me appears to be supported by Cubans who are older, more powerful, more moneyed, who come from a very different generation who, and who cannot seem to let 1963 stay in 1963. We're in 2001. How can you justify the relevance of the Cuban American National Foundation in today's day and age and what its mission is? Okay. Thank Good. you. Right. Good. 
you know, I'm not Cuban American either. Uh, although my experience is is having Cuban Americans express their their opinions is not a problem. Uh, be it in Miami or elsewhere, <laughs> people like to talk and argue and and, and debate this. Uh, your question on the foundation. Uh, as you may know, we, we had a split. We had a division, uh, among other reasons, because our organization had supported the Latin Grammys coming to Miami, for instance, and because we support the sorts of things that we've been talking about, which is a, a proactive approach of, of fostering democratic reform on island. There are other people, you know, sincere people, people who, who have uh, well thought out positions, but who believe we shouldn't do that, that we should only have the, the half the policy, the embargo, and nothing more. You know, I, I think they're wrong, but it's a legitimate position, just like Sally sometimes has a legitimate position. And uh, so, you know, we work at it. Uh, as far as is the community and the generational thing, uh, you know, again, my experience uh, is is that uh, there's a passion that runs across generations, across age groups, uh, across social and racial and economic and, and everything line. And, and you know, I don't care who you are, but I mean, the people who come out of Cuba today uh, are the ones who have grown up in the revolution. These are the people who have been fired from their jobs for speaking their mind, who've been put in prison for, for expressing an opinion, and uh, their passion is no less than, than other people's. But coming back to this whole issue of freedom of expression, I mean, yes, we all know that Cuban Americans are really vocal people and they're not afraid to express their views. <laughs> But I'm talking within Miami. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, uh, there well, was a know, poll that said that 70% of Cuban Americans in Miami said that they felt that not all points of view were being hurt, felt as if they were being heard on this particular issue. This was a poll that was conducted in 1997. 70%. I, I don't know. I, I, I just would, have this I would, you know, you spend a little time it listening. It was FIU. If you um, but you have this overwhelming statistic of people who are in Miami and they cannot, they, they feel as if they can't even speak out on the issue. They leave Miami and that's a different situation. Uh, you know, if you listen to the Spanish language radio in Miami. Uh, it's pretty one-sided. It's pretty well, one-sided. but it's not one-sided. There's lots of, mm -hmm. uh, of expressions of opinion. There's people yeah. that own different radio stations. Right. And that's the great thing about America, you know, is, is that you have a variety of opinion and people can express it. And all we're saying is, is that's what we want to have for Cuba, too. Thank you. So, Micho. Hi. Uh, I'm Micho Spring, Cuban-American, educated at the Kennedy School and specifically a former student of Graham Allison, a proud former hey. student of Graham <laughs> Allison. But um, I have a lot of questions, but I'm going to limit it to really one and not uh, with two parts. It seems to me, when I look at the Cuban issue, which I care passionately about, I've given up on the goal of doing anything that will get rid of Castro. I think you agree with that, that, that his oppression is so absolute that we better focus on something else. I've been to Cuba several times, hopefully in, in what you would call purposeful missions. And um, in those missions, I've talked to a lot of people, including our chief of, of, of the Cuban interest section. And I'm really focused on that moment in time when Castro dies and there is a transition. Right. And at that time, the yeah. isolation of Cuba that you so aggressively promote through the embargo is going to kill us because we're going to have no position to impact Cuba at that moment, which you've got to assume is going to be the biggest opportunity we're ever going to have to promote democracy or to help those, and I've met with many dissidents as well, who are eager to break out from um, this incredible oppression, which will go on without Castro unless there is a, unless those who love freedom prevail in that struggle. Mm -hmm. And so my question to you is, why not begin to position ourselves in a position of influence for that one moment? Why, why does the Helms Burton require us mm -hmm. to not change our policy until there's democracy in Cuba? Then it's over. I mean, that's really counterproductive to say we're not going to participate until it's all said and done and do we have anything to learn and, and this I would um, uh, ask both of you to uh, to answer do we have anything to learn from American policy in South Africa where we indeed had different levels of Sullivan principles the you know et cetera et cetera sanctions. to well but to <laughs> remove sanctions as there was yeah. some sort of so either to at least shift the dialogue but um, why not begin to position ourselves so we can make an, an impact and, and a difference before Raul Castro solidifies and, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, for another generation, the very thing we want to see gone? Okay. Uh, that's a great question. And it's one that, that I would say it's a mistake to think in terms of Castro dies transition. 
what's happening, and it's happening right now, is, is there's a succession going on while he's alive. And the succession is, is that power is shifting to the generals and the colonels that surround his brother, Raul. And that these are the ones uh, who are taking over, and these are the ones who have no desire, no intention of bringing a democratic uh, process uh, to fore. They want to hold on to the power that they've maintained. I think they'd like to be China. Uh, I think they're more likely to end up sort of Russia in the 90s, you know, sort of a, a, a mafia, a military uh, organization running the place. But that doesn't solve the basic issue. Uh, some of the other things you mentioned, yes, the Sullivan principles, there's an equivalent called the Arcos, Gustavo Arcos, that has uh, very similar principles that are in place. If these things can take effect, then it changes the situation and, and we respond to change. The, the question, it's not up here, but the question again is, is what should the United, should the United States right, right. change? As if we unilaterally will take an action, not asking anything of the Cubans. We want to give something for nothing. You know, I say something for something, we can talk about something for nothing is a bad deal. And my, my biggest disagreement with Sally and others is, is that if she's wrong, then what? But then, short of, short of no democracy in we Cuba. We have no power to influence events at all, and we simply wash our hands and say, gee, that's too yeah. bad, but I can really get a cheap But run. short of democracy in Cuba specifically, I mean, uh, uh, dispel the notion out there that the Cuban American Foundation really is hoping for an American um, led invasion the day after Castro dies. Help me understand under what other circumstances would you amend the embargo, and how would you do it? Well, I, I think uh, under uh, Helms Burton, for instance, talks about freeing political prisoners, right? Granting uh, the, uh, the UN Declaration of Human Rights, free speech, free press, these sorts of things. If, you know, the, the basic, uh, the secret in all of this, of course, is Castro can get rid of the embargo today. Today, he can get rid of it. All he has to do is give some measure of freedom to his people. And I guarantee you, the congressman and others will be up there and saying we need to reward these actions. And if he did something serious enough, then maybe even it'd be the right thing to do. But if he does nothing, and you anticipate nothing, and we change, and we get nothing. So you're right. happy if he dies before any of no, this happens with you know, it, letting him in total isolation? He, he is, he epitomizes the system, but he is not the system. There are lots of people just as repressive all around him, people who have grown up and profited from the current regime and who hope to continue to profit in a future regime. So it's not just Fidel Castro. It's the whole gang of thugs that need to be gone. Well, I'll, we I'll, I'll cede alter. my place, but I, do, I cannot believe you don't believe that if he dies, that'll be the greatest opportunity to impact what it comes will after. It'll be an so. opportunity, and I'm afraid we'll miss it. <laughs> well, I would only just say I think this is really a, an incredible misreading of a lot of history and combining a lot of things that shouldn't be combined. I mean, we never had a travel ban on South Africa. Um, for instance, Helms Burton says that um, uh, we dictate the policy in Cuba to the extent that if they have free and fair elections, but um, one of the people leading the country is either Raul or Fidel Castro, then we can't deal with them anyway. So our, um, you know, our lines go much deeper than that. Well, you know, Milosevic could run for president of Serbia again, right? Why not? <laughs> Unfortunately, <laughs> uh, we have time for only one more question, so I apologize. Oh. For everybody else who's up, this lady is, uh, okay. is next up. Mm -hmm. And actually, what we'll do is encourage mm -hmm. the people who didn't get to answer to ask their questions we'll to stay. come down at the, We're come down the front line right after. <laughs> but the local work rules here say mm -hmm. at 8.30, some people have mm -hmm. some other things that they need to go to. So let me mm -hmm. have this lady okay. make a short question mm -hmm. and short answers. Yeah. Vicki Kaiser, I'm a Cuban-American also. And um, after returning home for the first time in 1999 and coming back and talking with close family friends, I live here in the Boston area, but going down to Miami and Florida and visiting close family friends and, you know, really feeling an anguish over um, from them about why I would have gone. Um, you know, I wonder if you have any thoughts on sort of emotional reparations. I mean, there there is a generation that certainly is, you know, has a lot of emotional baggage with um, whether keeping the embargo or um, you know how to make a change and what will happen next and I, I wonder if you have any thoughts on this how to help us through that yeah actually one of the things uh, we produced uh, or actually some of our students uh, including some uh, who attend this institution uh, worked over the summer 
uh, on a, uh, a video that was entitled uh, Reconciliation. Uh, and you're right, the, the emotional scars are extremely deep. Uh, it's going to be very difficult for a lot of people to work their way through it, but I think increasingly there's a recognition that, that this is something that needs to happen uh, and that there's an artificial division. And the artificial division has been caused by Fidel Castro and his thugs. And once not we can by move the past that, well, you know, it's well, you know, it's the embargo is not killing people. It's not denying people their rights. It's not throwing people in prison. You know, the embargo means we don't trade, but everybody else does. Uh, but but to, to get to your point, because it's a serious one, is is that you know there has to be a common ground, and and family provides some of that. Uh, but I come back to it, it's got to be a, a respect for the dignity of the individual, and that is what is absent in the regime. Let's get there, and then I think it'll work out. It's going to be messy, it's going to be difficult, but it'll happen. So, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm hopeful, but in the midterm. Well, I think I'd only say I'm very pleased to have been here tonight, and for any of you who thought that the Cuban-American community was indeed a monolith in support of our present policy, I think that myth has been pretty well exploded by the voices that we've heard here tonight. So, thank you. Well, let me say on behalf of uh, the Kennedy School and Harvard, uh, both to uh, the two ambassadors uh, who I think uh, provided us a quite uh, crisp and uh, lively uh, statement of the competing views, and to the audience, which uh, shows, uh, I think, not uh, only respect, but also a lot of real thought about this. Mm. This is what the forum is supposed to be about, and I think John Kennedy would be proud of the evening. So <laughs> thank you guys very much. Mm -hmm. Let's do it. Yeah. Left yeah, it. All oh, great. Yeah. I do. Um, if you can wait one second, I'll go get them. They're okay. back in the uh, folder.